Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Good evening, everybody. My name is Chris, and I am an alcoholic. Oh, somewhere on or around December 28th, 1989, I had my separation experience. Uh, Struggled my way back into Alcoholics Anonymous with uh, a renewed determination to... uh, uh, to participate to a level that might actually work. Uh, from that period of time, I've always been sponsored. And since uh, somewhere around October uh, 1990, I've always sponsored. Uh, always participated with a home group, uh, always found service commitments, uh, and learned that, uh, that my life depended on, uh, on practicing spiritual principles that I learned in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. And all of that has enabled, uh, enabled, uh, uh, the grace of God to be thick enough on me, uh, so that I've been, uh, separated from alcohol all these years. And, uh, in effect been reborn, like it talks about in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. There's some wonderful, wonderful things that are going on in my life. And if you would have seen me back in the 80s, what kind of a mess I was, uh, you would, you would never have, never have predicted that I would have been able to accomplish anything, that I would have been able to get out of my own way. And, uh, I have been, and uh, all of this uh, makes me incredibly grateful to Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, grateful to this group uh, to, to ask me up so many times to uh, to kind of celebrate uh, Alcoholics Anonymous on its birthday, and to talk a little bit about the history and a little bit about uh, its relevance today, and sometimes even uh, about some of the challenges that Alcoholics Anonymous is facing today, and some of the responsibility that we uh, uh, we need to take on uh, as members in good standing of Alcoholics uh, Anonymous. Ever since, ever since man started crushing grapes and started to be able to distill uh, alcohol, there has been a portion of the population who were susceptible to alcoholism. Uh, over over history, you, you read about it in the Bible. I mean, you you read about um, alcoholism all throughout the ages, and they looked at it uh, in different ways at different periods of time. But ninety nine point nine percent of the time, it was misunderstood. Uh, the uh, alcoholism uh, as an illness was uh, was misunderstood. Uh, you most often died from it. Uh, there's this great book uh, that uh, William, a man named William White uh, down in Florida uh, wrote, and it's called Chasing the Dragon. And it's the history of addiction treatment. It's the history of alcoholism treatment uh, over the course of the years, in the last several hundred years. And it's just absolutely amazing some of the remedies and some of the treatments that they came up with for treatment of alcoholism. Um, Heavy metals was very, very popular. Uh, shooting you up with heavy metals. This is in the late 1800s. It's called called the Keeley cure, the gold cure. And they would actually take these very poisonous heavy metals and inject you with them. And they would basically say, after this, you're cured. You know, you're you won't live much past five more years, but you're cured. Uh, there's been periods of time where, uh, you know, in certain different countries, uh, repeated uh, repeated offenses related to alcoholism would uh, uh, would get you killed. Um, there's in recent memory, there was one country that uh, would pour molten lead down your throat after repeated bouts of uh, problems uh, uh, that result in alcoholism. And that's not something I ever want to have happen to me. One of the strangest ones was, uh, was, in, uh, was in France uh, uh, several hundred years ago. They would put you in these sarcophaguses. They were like these mummy stands that stood up, and they had a door where they would feed you your food and water. And once a week they would clean this thing out, and they would just lock you into this thing, and you just couldn't move. They knew the second they let you out of this, you were going to go get drunk, and you were going to probably die. So they were quite content to keep you locked up in these things forever. 
um, you know, unbelievable, horrible uh, stories to, and, and horrible experiences that alcoholics have had uh, over the last, you know, thousands of, of years. We have been misunderstood. We've suffered from a grave illness. Um, and it was only around the turn of the century where people started to understand a little bit about the solution. And I, I, think, I think the solution came a little bit before the common problem. Because what happened was some of us were uh, were showing up in these evangelical religious cult like groups around the turn of the century, and really what they were were there were places where the the ravenously religious would gather and they got about the business of living life along biblical lines, however they saw that and you know over the years some people misperceive exactly what that is, and uh, we have problems with uh, with uh, the fanatics of uh, of certain types of religions sometimes, but what these people believed in is they believed in serious participation. They believed in coming early, staying late, and asking if there's anything else that you can do. And uh, they they uh, they had sponsorship, not in that term, but uh, but basically you had uh, you had mentorship. You uh, you did a lot of the things that Alcoholics Anonymous borrowed from those uh, those groups because what happened was when alcoholics would stumble into these groups, they would get sober. And they'd never been sober before. Funny thing, you know, Bill Wilson got sober in the Osher group and wrote the book, basically was the, 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 uh, the main architect of the book, Alcoholics Anonymous. But he was not only, he was not even, not the first alcoholic to get sober in the Osher group. He wasn't even the first alcoholic that got sober in the Osher group to write a book about it. There was probably 15 or 20 books written by Osher Group members who were, you know, former alcoholics who had gotten sober in the Osher Group and then decided to write books about it. The thing that was different about Bill Wilson was, and you can read this in his story, when he's on his hospital bed, it comes into his mind that now that he's found this solution through Ebby Thatcher in the Osher Group, he could carry this message to still suffering alcoholics, and they in turn could carry that message to other still suffering alcoholics. And a chain reaction could take place that could end up bringing about recovery for all of these hopeless and helpless uh, suffering alcoholics. And he, and that conclusion he came to on his hospital bed detoxing from alcohol. And a lot of us have had those type of convictions. We've come to the conclusion that we should dedicate our life to something, but we didn't hold on to it. Bill Wilson held on to it. And when he got out of that hospital, he made his primary purpose, carrying the message of recovery, living life along spiritual lines, to the still sick and suffering alcoholics. Now, Bill was a character. If you do enough studying about early AA, you're going to learn something that you're not going to learn in the conference-approved literature. You're going to learn that these people were a bit touched in the head and amazing characters. And their, their character defects were all over them. Now, I, for one, appreciate that. I don't need to be... You don't need to hide the facts of our history from me. You know, uh, I, I'd rather know really what happened because it gives me it gives me inspiration to know that these people had had feet of clay and they made a lot of mistakes because that's really the name of the game. It's not the mistakes we make; it's what we do with the mistakes after we make them. How do we deal with them? How do we take responsibility for them? And every single one of these early AA members that's, you know, uh, looms large in our history uh, learned how to, how to move away from those mistakes and turn them into assets. And, and Bill and Bob were, were certainly two people that were, were able to do that. Now, I think everybody here knows a little bit of the story about how, how Bill went out to Akron. You know, he was trying to take over a tire company. A big surprise, you know, an alcoholic, you know, a bum who wants to take over a business and become president of it, you know. Big surprise there. Uh, and also a big surprise it didn't work out. Um, and and that's when uh, that's when he, he bumps into uh, bumps into Dr. Bob and they make a pact. Let's stick together. 
We either we need to stick together, uh, we need to hang together, or we're going to hang separately, which is something that we learn in Alcoholics Anonymous. This is why we need to be consistent with meetings, and we need to participate in home group activities. We need to stick together. Out there on our own, we are going to get picked off. And this is something that they learned in the early days. The people who stayed with Bill and continued to go to the meetings and continued to go to Greystone Hospital on the commitments and continued to, to work with other people and take other people through the steps, those are the ones that stayed sober. The ones that fell off and you know disappeared and went to do their own thing were the ones who uh, who didn't. Now, a couple of a couple of groups of Alcoholics Anonymous uh, started, and they weren't even called that until the book was written. Really, the fellowship was named after the book, not the book after the fellowship. Because up until the book was written, they really were Oxford Group members or people who had just left the Oxford Group and were just a, a group of drunks, you know, working the 12 steps, uh, trying to stay sober. So there was the New York, there was the Akron, and then the second group was Cleveland. And Cleveland started also in the in the very late uh, 30s, and Cleveland Cleveland was a piece of work. Cleveland was uh, was run by by a, a very very interesting individual. I've listened to many of this guy's workshops. Clarence uh, Clarence Snyder. Uh, he lived he lived up until the 80s, and he would tell his stories about the early days of AA. And very few people survived, you know, from those early days like he did. And uh, I don't I don't take his uh, his recollections as gospel. Because the more you listen to this guy, the more you worry about about historical accuracy. But basically, what he uh, what he said was uh, is that when they started the group in in Cleveland, they decided that they were not going to be part of the Oxford group; that they were going to just be Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, we're not going to be affiliated with religion. We're not going to be affiliated with the Oxford Group. And we're going to base our fellowship meeting on the book that was just published. And because of that, Dr. Bob and a whole bunch of the Akron Group got baseball bats, jumped in the car, and went up there to kick the living crap out of these Cleveland people for doing something different. You don't see that and pass it on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, but doesn't, that, doesn't that make a lot of sense? You know, isn't that just like us? You know, the, gr- the group split. You know, let's go get them. I mean, it just it makes, it makes absolute per- perfect sense to me. <laughs> anyway, you know, through all this, through all this, uh, this, this, this craziness, uh, what emerged from it all was meetings, steps, service equal permanent sobriety and contented life. That was the big message that was coming out of these early groups. Now, uh, the book Alcoholics Anonymous was published. Um, I have uh, I've spent the last well just recently I moved out of the uh, uh, the professional addiction treatment uh, uh, modality uh, I'd had enough of it thank you uh, for three and a half years what I what I was doing was I was in I was in the, the uh, uh, professional treatment media if there is such a thing and I was inter- interviewing uh, treatment professionals and I had a web show and I was a media director for a for a, a big nonprofit, and I was going all over the country, all over Europe, uh, interviewing these people and going to all the addiction symposiums and everything. And, and uh, you know, I I, uh, I came out of that experience, uh, you know, very very disillusioned as far. Well, I, you know, I didn't have a whole a heck of a lot of respect for professional treatment before I got into this. Uh, but but after getting close to to the biggest, the brightest, and the best, I'm even more disillusioned with uh, with professional treatment than I was going into this. And and listen, you know, I I learned a lot in three and a half years. I know what they I know what the best of them do, and I know how the best of them think. And there's a few scattered individuals that get it. But for the most part, the people who are treating us and charging us money for treatment don't even know what our problem is. They think our problem is, is a lack of, uh, of materials we can get with prescription pads. They think, uh, they think our problems are uh, you know, uh, related to deep psychological trauma and shame issues when we were four. 
And, you know, the fact of the matter is, is 10% of the population have al alcoholic uh, metabolism. It's a metabolic. It's, 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 it's in our genes. It's, it's so deeply ingrained in us that any forms of professional treatment or any forms of, of, of pharmaco pharmacological interventions are, are, are going to be unbelievably ineffective because this is such an aggressive illness. Alcoholism is so aggressive that these other treatments and these other interventions that these people are coming up with are just not well suited for the intensity uh, this, the, the urgency that alcoholism demands. Now, back to 1930, uh, Bill Wilson being dragged into this Oxford group and, and, and being forced to make amends and being forced to confess his sins and being forced to look at his, you know, his actual faults and where he was wrong and, hit, and then, uh, then showing him how to pray and meditate and then go out and help others and try to be of service in the world. That was an intervention of the type of intensity that can actually help alcoholics. And it wasn't even a treatment for alcoholism at that time. What it was was it was an evangelical um, a group of people who just wanted to drag you in and get you busy, uh, get you busy with God's work. And that's what worked. When they wrote the book Alcoholics Anonymous, they were very, very close to the trenches at that period of time. Most of these alcoholics were, uh, th this, is, this is what it would look like in those early days. Someone would tell you you needed to, you needed to get hooked up with these, these drunks who got sober. And you would be put in front of them. And they would come up to you and they would qualify you. This is something we don't do enough of in Alcoholics Anonymous anymore. But they would qualify you. They would ask you the questions that would, that would lead them, them, to believe whether or not you're alcoholic. And they would ask you these questions. And when they were convinced that you were alcoholic, they would start to talk about their own life. They would start to tell their own story. And then they would lay out the recovery process, which was the 12 steps, for you to take or leave. And if you left them, they would say, well, you know, here's, here's my phone number, or you know where you can find me. If you're willing to recover from alcoholism, sometime and you need help I'd be glad to help you but I but you know this is what we do and if you were willing to go as they say to any lengths and uh, and to to do what they did to overcome alcoholism uh, they would bring you into the fold and they would start moving you through the steps somewhere around amends they would allow you to go to those meetings that we heard about earlier uh, which was one night a week we, we set aside time for an open meeting or whatever and, uh, and if you showed that you meant business in that you were taking constructive action with the recovery process which were the tenets of the Oxford group before they were laid out in the book Alcoholics Anonymous after they were laid out in the book Alcoholics Anonymous they were the steps when you showed that you were willing, uh, willing to take those and participate in that recovery process, you were brought into the fold. You were moved through the steps, and then you were encouraged to go out and find other people to work with. So there may be one meeting a week. Uh, the rest of the time, you're, you're gathering together, working the steps, or going and finding alcoholics to take through the steps. That's what Alcoholics Anonymous was in the early days. And that's when it showed results, prodigious results. Now, the fellowship has grown over the years. The fellowship has grown uh, a lot. In the last 10 years or so, um, there's, there's differing statistics, and I don't think AA has really done a decent audit uh, in a long, long time. I know I, I haven't been, uh, uh, you know, nothing has gone through my home group as far as uh, questionnaires on, on membership. I think it's been a long time since there's been a full-blown audit. The, the last one I remember was like 1993. But anyway, um, the statistics that you get uh, uh, are, are probably not all that accurate, but I believe that, uh, that AA 
hasn't grown very much in the last 10 or 15 years. I think we've remained static as far as, uh, as membership levels. And, and even, uh, even more disturbing than that uh, is, I think, uh, uh, the statistics on, on retention in Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, um, one of the arguments I got in, into uh, with one of these professional groups, and I, I don't do it anymore because... Sometimes you just have to stop fighting alcohol or anything else, you know, uh, in, in your recovery. You can't just keep beating your head against the wall. But I was involved in a couple of the professional forums on LinkedIn and a couple of the uh, places where you blog. And this guy, basically, this is the, this is the professional argument. This is, a, this is a person who prides himself as being a professional addiction treatment specialist, okay? Um, he, he says he doesn't send people to AA when they come for him for help. His reaction to me was uh, the statistics on AA are somewhere between 4 and 8% retention. He goes, I could get that with a placebo. This is what one of the most prominent professionals in addiction treatment told me. Why would I send somebody to a cult if I could give them a placebo and it would have about the same chances of working. Now, I understand that argument and it's, it's, a, um, it's a false argument on a number of levels. A lot of it is our fault though in Alcoholics Anonymous and I'll, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. When they take those statistics, what they do is they stand outside by the door you know, one day, if there's, if there's somebody asking questions with a pad and a pencil out by your door, it's somebody doing one of these studies for some study group, you know, from some college or whatever. And what they'll do is they'll ask you, you know, uh, how long have you been going to AA? How long have you been in there? You know, a lot of the old-time members will just blow by these people. You know, this is an anonymous program, but they'll get some people that will stop and talk to them. And the people that stop and talk to them um, basically... Probably four. Well, actually, this came out of the grapevine. Forty-five percent of them have less have less than sixty days. Uh, the people that they interview outside at the door, forty percent of them have less than sixty days. Now that's 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 unbelievable to me. And I, you know, I know why they get these statistics. I know why they get them because it's impossible to get good statistics in an anonymous fellowship. You know, we have no we have no opinion on outside issues. We're not going to sit out there and give you, you know, our, 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 all this information on. Uh, on it's, it's not comfortable to us. You know, we're we're a, we're an anonymous fellowship, so the, they'll get what they can get. And the statistics are always between four and eight percent of the people you know have have found have found recovery who they've talked to outside the door because we get so many people who try us for a week or two and then. And they're gone. Try us for a month or two, and then they're gone. Now, rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. I believe that's still true, but following our path is not showing up at our meetings. That is not following the path. Yet a lot of these treatment professionals, a lot of the people who are criticizing us out there today, think that that's what this is. It's meetings. It's not. It's a program of recovery that is the 12 steps. If you take the 12 steps, that's our recovery program. If you come to the meetings and you don't recover and you don't do the steps, it's not our fault. You know what I mean? So, so when they say our statistics are really lousy, what I'll say back to them is, rarely have we seen a person fail who follows our path. Not everybody that shows up in these meetings follows our, follows our path. Sometimes that's our fault, and sometimes that's their fault. You know, I don't want it to, I don't want it to be my fault. You know, so I'll, I'll always offer, if somebody asks me for help, I'll always tell them that, you know, the help really is in the steps. Yes, I want you at meetings. I want you as a home group member. I want you doing service commitments. You know, that, that's the gift that you give back, you know, after you've, uh, you've achieved some sobriety. And the steps are how you get some recovery. So anyway, no other time that I've ever seen in Alcoholics Anonymous have we been under attack more from outside people than we are today. Uh, doctors and psychiatrists and even treatment professionals are, are, not, are no longer 
sending people to us. Not the way they used to. Are there still people who are our advocates and our friends in these places? Yes. But less and less of them. Less and less of them. Uh, more and more they're seeing us as a religious organization. More and more they're seeing us as a failed entity with 5% recovery rate. You know, and, uh, and again, uh, this is Alcoholics Anonymous' birthday. Um, I owe my life to AA. My best friends are in AA. I've, uh, I've, achieved, I've achieved everything that I've achieved in the last 20 years as a direct result from, from just participating in this fellowship and listening, listening to you all. So I'm, I'm really, really grateful for AA. And, and I, understand, uh, I understand also that we need to take Alcoholics Anonymous seriously. You know, we, uh, this, is, this is a group... Um, this particular group, I think, is probably the best home group in New Jersey right now. Uh, I'm, I'm sending people here whenever, uh, whenever possible because of uh, the level of enthusiasm. And when I come in here, there's people working the steps over there in the corner. They're doing the service commitments. You're, you're suiting up. You're showing up. And it's about the business of Alcoholics Anonymous. And you don't have a 5% recovery rate here. Uh, you know that. You guys know that. Because, you know, I mean, you're, you're, you're paying attention to who's celebrating. There's a lot of people that are celebrating a lot of time here. That's how, it's, that's how it needs to be done. That's how it needs to be done. Now, what, what, what's changed in AA? How did they go from the 1930s, where it was all about out there on the streets? AA was out there on the streets. How did it go from that to bad therapy groups? You know, where you throw a dollar in and you talk about your issues. How did that happen? You know, how did that happen? It doesn't have, it's not everywhere. You know, there's great groups. I get, an, I get an opportunity to go all over the place, and I find wonderful groups. Uh, wonderful groups. And then I, then I find groups that are a little bit off track, a little bit off the beam. Uh, but <clears throat> what's happened? What's changed in AA? I believe that as the fellowship group... Um, as the dynamics of the individuals in, uh, in the AA fellowships have changed, that we've taken, uh, we've taken the sense of urgency away from the 12 steps, and we've put more emphasis on, uh, on group meeting attendance. And I think that that's okay, Unless you're in real trouble with alcoholism, um, if you read the if you read the essay Bill wrote on step one in the twelve and twelve, he, this is basically written around 1949 or so. He says all of a sudden we started to see people that were showing up in Alcoholics Anonymous who were barely potential alcoholics. They had not even felt the nip of the ringer. They still had a car in the garage. They still had a job. He's, he's talking about the changes in the type of individuals that were showing up in the fellowship. In the early days, in the first 10 or 15 years, there were low, what they called low-bottom cases only. It really takes somebody that feels hopeless to take their AA and put it out there on the street. In other words, to go through the steps and then to go out and search out other alcoholics that need help. Go to the asylums. Go to the detoxes. Go to, go to the rehabs. Go to the hospitals. Talk to the judges. Talk to the doctors. Make yourself available for being helpful to someone who wants to get over drinking. It takes somebody who really, really is convinced they're in a lot of trouble to do something like that. That is, that's a real uh, commitment to turn your will and your life over to the care of Alcoholics Anonymous in that type of a way. And what happened was Bill noticed that in the 40s, uh, people were coming in who, who hadn't gone down the scale that, that far. Um, they, did not, they did not have that sense of urgency about getting out there and starting to take the message to still suffering alcoholics thinking that that's the only way they're going to survive, is by carrying the message in an intense way. And what happened was, uh, was the fellowship started to, started to grow and started to uh, change. The fellowship now 
uh, became the primary aspect of Alcoholics Anonymous. AA went from in the 30s and 40s from being a recovery program with a support fellowship to being a fellowship with a sometimes applicable program. Because it started to be said in the Grapevine magazine and other places that you didn't need to take the steps right away. In other, in other words, you don't need to believe anything or you don't need to do anything. You just need to have an open mind. And there was messages like this that on the surface, they're very, very good messages. But I think they started to contribute to, uh, cont- contribute to the decline of serious participation in the recovery uh, process. You know, over the years, I've seen a, I've seen a lot of people die of alcoholism. You all have too. Uh, it's not it's not pretty. Um, there's there was a period of time in my home group where people would blow through. They wouldn't engage though. They would come to the meetings and they would listen, but they wouldn't get a sponsor and they wouldn't start to practice the steps. They just kind of blew through the meetings. And we would try to capture these people. We would try to talk to these people, but they seemed unreachable. They seemed unconvinced that they needed to engage with us. And there was a period of time in my home group where someone someone would leave our group and within two weeks put a bullet to their head. We, we, had a, we had a series of about seven years where there were suicides that were following people that have, had left our group. I think we've all seen this happen uh, at least sometime in our, uh, in our AA career. What happens? What's that about? Um, it's about the pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization that happens after we relapse one more time, knowing there's a better way. It's about that loneliness that the alcoholic experiences, that unbearable loneliness that the alcoholic experiences when we think once more we're out there on our own. It's that sense of, it's that overwhelming emotional feelings of guilt and shame and remorse for letting the people that we love down one more time. We can't take it one more time. And usually in a period of sobriety, in between binges, we take our life. Now, what is that about? We have, a, we have a spiritual illness. It's an unorthodox illness. The early AAs recognized this. They recognized it as spiritual. They recognized it as mental. And they recognized it as physical. It's also emotional. And you can put the emotional in there as spiritual if, if you want to keep it a threefold illness. But it's also emotional. And what happens to us is we are, we are in bondage to emotional self at certain periods of time with this illness. This is an unorthodox illness. It's, it does not present like other diseases, like other fatal maladies. It just doesn't. It's tricky. It's cunning. It's baffling. It's powerful. And we, a lot of times, remain unconvinced that our problems are related to our alcoholism. We think our problems are at such a deep level, that they're, they're part of us at such a deep level, that we are at fault. You know, we're suffering from an illness that we feel we're at fault. And we get to a point where we, we, we can't take it anymore. Um, because of the characteristics of this illness... It requires a spiritual solution. It requires us to do work on the spiritual plane that will bring about emotional recovery so that we're no longer in bondage to self, so that we're happy, joyous, free. We feel that sense of ease and, ease and comfort. We, 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 have, we understand the word serenity because we experience it at different times in our life. And that's what our recovery process has to be. It's misunderstood by us. It's misunderstood by the people that treat us, most of them. It's misunderstood by society. Uh, the problem and the solution is misunderstood. Um, you can't make money on the solution to alcoholism. But everybody is trying. The one thing that I came out of this, my whole experience with the professional treatment community is this. And I believe this to the core of my being. If it works for addiction and alcoholism, you can't charge for it. 
And if you charge for it, it can't work. That's just what I believe. Now, does all of this stuff help? Is it helpful for problems other than alcohol? Is it helpful to put people in clinical environments where they can get a chance to start to look at their first step problems? Absolutely. Do we need detoxes? Absolutely. Do we need rehabs? Absolutely. But they are not a solution. They are a brief intervention at best. And a lot of times when you come to the belief that they are going to treat you and cure you, you're going to be in, in, deep, uh, in deep trouble. Um, I've found that over the years, my participation levels in Alcoholics Anonymous have to go up. When I first came in here, I believed that I needed to put a lot of work in up front. I need to do my 90 and 90, and I need to put a lot of work up in, in up front, but then I can start backing away. Well, I suffer from a really bad case of alcoholism. I know that because of my last couple of years, when I put alcohol in my body, it was not good. I needed to be medically detoxed. It was really ugly. You, you, you know, it was not pretty. And I know that's where I am today physically with my alcoholism. So put alcohol back in my body and I'm right, I'm back there and worse. But I also understand that alcoholism is, is, is a progressive illness. Over any considerable period of time, it gets worse, it doesn't get better. Regardless of whether you're drinking, alcoholism gets worse, it doesn't get better. Do our lives get better? Do we recover and grow spiritually? Absolutely. But our alcoholism, which is within us, gets worse every single day, every single week, every single month, every single year. And I've found that to remain at, at a decent level, to, to participate in the maintenance of my spiritual condition uh, and stay at a level where it's comfortable and I don't start getting cranky and freaking out, I have to put more and more in every year to AA. More time, more effort, more of a, more of a level of participation. And you know what? That's okay uh, for me today. That I would have seen that as a sentence. You know, in my first year, it's not. What it is is it's a it's a it's hope. It's a, it's a promise because. What Alcoholics Anonymous has given me is incredible. And the more I participate in Alcoholics Anonymous, the better off I am and the people that are around me. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, in AA today, uh, where we need to take responsibility, and I, I, be, I believe this, and anyone I sponsor, um, this is what I, I share with them. We need to be informed group members. Too often, votes in AA uh, are taking place with people who have little or no understanding of what Alcoholics Anonymous is, what it stands for, and what its principles are. I think as, uh, as sponsors, as, as group members, we need to become informed members. We have to do a little bit of study on the traditions. We have to understand the application of the traditions. We have to, we have to be able to see... Uh, what the tradition has been put there for, not necessarily to use the tradition as, as a weapon, but to understand the principle of the tradition and understand that the, the principles are very, very important that these traditions were put together to protect. I think we need to understand, at least on a surface level, the 12 concepts of world service and how the, ser how the service levels interact with each other. Because I think that's going really, really to the left field now. I see, uh, I see a lot of really good people, a lot of really great AA members participating in, in the AA structure, you know, becoming a, a, a GSR, becoming a DCM, you know, all the way up to delegate. I see that process going, going wacky. Uh, and, and I think it's basic, I think it's based on, uh, people who have a lot of really, really good intentions, but they're not informed, experienced group members. 
They don't really understand the traditions. They don't really understand uh, the 12 concepts of service. And even more importantly, they don't have a recovery experience. They've never gone through the steps themselves. So they're misperceiving what this whole thing is about. Rather than carry the message of the 12 steps of recovery to the still sick and suffering alcoholic, they see it as a self-perpetuating, let's, let's make this fellowship stronger, uh, and, and that pulls us away from our primary purpose. Our primary purpose is not to build up a monstrously rich fellowship. That's not what our primary purpose is. Our primary purpose is to become as effective as possible at carrying the message of the 12 steps to the still sick and suffering alcoholic. And you can sit in some of these high-level meetings going all the way up to Riverside, New York, and not hear a thing about that. It's, it, you know, a lot of times uh, I'm, I'm very good friends with some people that are on the AA board. And uh, uh, I was asked to participate at one point in time. And, you know, what I've, what I've learned is, is scary. It really, it really is scary. Uh, today, uh, uh, today I, I, I don't even know if they're clear on what the primary purpose is in the upper levels of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I think as group members, I think when we participate, we owe it to ourselves to be informed group members. That's the only way that this thing can change and stay safe for our children. The only way it's going to stay safe is for us to understand what we need to know and to be uh, advocates for what is important in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, this is not a self-help group. So many people think AA is a self-help group. It is nowhere near a self-help group. This is, this is a place yourself at the feet of the Lord and hope that you can, hope that the grace of God will come down on you. And when the grace of God comes down, your gift back to that grace is participation in Alcoholics Anonymous at whatever levels you have the energy for. You know, it is not a self-help uh, program. It's a God-help program. And so often uh, today we, we, take, we take our eyes on what, the, what is the power? What is the power today in AA? You know, uh, I, I've done it myself. Over the years I thought the power in AA was my, my personal participation in it. You know, I stay sober because I do this. You know, that's just making me God when I do things like that. You know, the, alcoholism is... Uh, it's cunning, it's baffling and powerful. The recovery process is baffling. The recovery process is unorthodox. For what other illness do you have to go to God to heal? Wouldn't you just go to a medical professional? You know, if you had cancer or, you know, rickets or, you know, corns on your feet or whatever. Don't you just don't you go to a professional and they'll take care of it? Why can't we do that with alcoholism? Alcoholism is supposed to be a disease. But we can't. We can't. We have to go within and we have to go uh, to the one who has all power. And I think that's changing in Alcoholics Anonymous today. There are groups that are taking the prayers out. There, uh, there's, there's, uh, there's literature being planned uh, at the highest levels of AA uh, for, uh, for atheists. You know, how atheists can be good AA members. So, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to sit up here and say that we don't want atheists. I think a lot of us are atheists when we get here. Yes, we want atheists. But no, we don't want to promote atheism as a part of our program. Uh, I, that's not what we are. Uh, show me a step that doesn't have uh, the intention to turn one's will over to God in one way or another. And, uh, you know, I'll say maybe, maybe we can have literature uh, based on, uh, on atheism. But, uh, you know, I don't believe that we can. And these are things that I think as group members we need to be voting on. We need to be giving, uh, giving to our GSRs and sending them back. To their, to, their, to their DCMs and sending those DCMs to the delegates and send, sending the delegates to the trustees and telling them, look, we want to hang on, we want to hang on to, the, to, the, to the magic in this thing. We don't want to confuse it and complicate it with a lot of stuff that's good, but it's, it's not great. You know, the, sometimes the good is the enemy of the best, is what Bill Wilson always used to say. You know, uh, this wasn't one of my typical history talks, um, and uh, you know I don't apologize for that. I think I think uh, I, I've uh, there's been some concerns with me uh, in the last several years on uh, on how well the newcomers have been uh, been served. 
uh, in Alcoholics Anonymous uh, as a whole. Certainly not, not not in this group. This is a group that uh, that does it right, and I love this group. But in other areas, I don't think the survivability, if you're an alcoholic, I don't think the survivability rates are as good as they used to be. And, and uh, uh, I've grown kind of concerned about that. And uh, and uh, I, I wanted I wanted to sh- I wanted to take the opportunity uh, to share that in that you know my talk was on Alcoholics Anonymous tonight. You know what are what are some of the great things that are uh, that are going on um, in AA? Um, we're spreading to all kinds of different countries. Uh, the big book is getting translated in all kinds of different languages. Um, if you're looking for a service commitment in AA and, and you know some wacky kind of language, uh, help them out because uh, one of the things that we do best is to provide literature to other countries uh, on our recovery process, the big book, the step book, and we've got some really, really bad translations that are out there. Uh, um, you know, you, uh, the German one, you know, uh, is a horrible. Uh, the the one in Russia, you know, they'll take God out of it. You know, like they'll take the word God out of it. Yeah. It, and so there's some really, really bad translations. So that they could probably use some help uh, refining and uh, redefining some of the translations. Uh, we do that really well. We're still probably the best and only uh, house on the block if you're in real trouble from alcoholism. Uh, professional treatment can still help the, the heavy drinker, can still help the, the, the recreational drug users and the people that get in trouble and get DUIs and get busted with a bag of coke. Uh, the professional people can still help those people. They can say, hey, idiot, stop, and they'll stop, okay? If you can't stop, uh, if you're an alcoholic uh, and you can't stop, like I couldn't, Alcoholics Anonymous is the only uh, the only uh, place on the block, and it's it's probably going to remain so uh, because of um, the recovery process. It's a brilliant recovery process. There has been thousands of books that have been written since the Big Book that that try to uh, eclipse the importance of the book Alcoholics Anonymous in, in uh, alcoholism recovery. Uh, you can't turn on the TV without there being, uh, being a new cure for alcoholism that only costs $48,000 a month. You know, you, 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 can't, you can't shake a stick without hitting some idiot that doesn't understand alcoholism but has the cure for it anyway. And, um, and Alcoholics Anonymous is still the only place I know of that if you're a real alcoholic, you can come through these doors. And if you're willing, if you become willing, as willing as the dying can be, as willing as the drowning who sees on to life preservers, if you can be that willing, uh, you too are going are, are gonna to get this. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. And, uh, you know, this is, uh, this is a group that believes very, very strongly in sponsorship and carrying the message. You know, I know at least half of you uh, out there, and I know your, your personal recovery uh, processes, and uh, they're, they're admirable. You know, keep up the good work. This is, uh, this is an oasis in a sea of mediocrity. You know, I hate to say that, but it's, uh, but it's true. As, as you get to be a cranky old-timer, you know, you can, you can tell the truth without caring what people think. As much, you know. I don't care. Uh, that's what I. That's what I believe, anyway. Uh, you know. Thank you so much for for being here. Thank you so much for asking me up here. I, sometimes I wonder why you do it. Why you have me back here year after year? It just gets worse. Uh, but uh, but you know. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.